Dragon Table, I'll be going over a tutorial on how to play Stone Age from Rio Grande Games. Um, it is a really fun worker placement and resource management Euro game set in the Stone Age. Two to four players, and I'm going to be going over how to play the base game. There is an expansion uh, that's kind of fun, but we're just going to do the base game today. So let's take a look. This is Stone Age, set up for a four-player game. Ooh, I'm going out of my comfort zone. Set up for four instead of three. Ooh. The reason I did that is because there are different rules for when you play with three players or two players. Um, I want to go over the most basic rules first, and then I will tell you about the differences for when you play with either three or two players. The first and most important rule is that if you have the new version of this game, which I, this is actually um, only a couple years old, so this is the newer version of the game, you are allowed to smell the cup, and it smells okay. If you have an older version of this game, say a version from three, four, or five years ago, please do not smell this cup. It smells very bad. That's the first rule of Stone Age. Don't smell the cup, unless it's new. Smells fine. So each person has their own player board, and then we have the main board in the middle that everyone will be... There's a dog under my table. So each player has their own player board, in addition to the main board where we'll all be playing. I have set out five meeples of each color on each board, and although it's, oh, I think it's unsightly to have plastic bags on the table. The reason I do this and I keep the extra meeples in the plastic bags is because when it's not your turn, it's really easy to get fiddly with your meeples and accidentally add in meeples that aren't supposed to be there yet. And before you know it, you accidentally have uh, seven or eight meeples when you should only have five or six. So my suggestion is keep your meeples in the bag until you actually make new ones. So each turn has three phases. On the first phase of the turn, starting with the first player, you're going to go round robin, placing your workers out on the board to accomplish tasks. Once all the workers have been placed, then again, starting in the order of the first player, you're going to remove your workers, accomplish tasks, which will involve rolling dice or paying resources in order to pay for things. Um, uh, and then uh, once all the workers have been taken back, the third phase is uh, feeding your workers. You always have to feed your workers the same amount of food as you have workers at the end of your turn. And you start the game with 12 food and 5 meeples. So you know you're going to be good for food for at least the first two turns. And you don't have to worry about food yet. But you will eventually. Now I'm going to zoom in on this game board so I can show you what the different things are that you can do when you place your workers. Any place on the board where you see one of these little drawn circles is a place where you can put a meeple and accomplish a task. Uh, I've zoomed into this first little area right here, kind of in the center bottom of the board. That's kind of the little village maybe where you would think of the meeples as living. And there are three different stations where you can put meeples to accomplish tasks. If you put a meeple here, you will get a farm. And that will allow you to move up one on the farm track, which is off on the side of the board. Having a farm means that you have one less uh, meeple that you have to feed each turn. So instead of having to feed your, your five meeples five food, if you had a farm, you would only have to feed them four food. Uh, and if you had two farms, you would have to feed them three food, and so on. So having farms is good, especially if you start having more meeples. That happens in what I like to call the Maple Love Shack. It requires, surprise, surprise, two meeples. You have to put two meeples on this location at the Love Shack. And at the end of your turn, or at the end of when you're pulling in all your meeples to collect your actions, you get to add a new meeple to your board. The thing to keep in mind is that you will have to feed that meeple at the end of the turn. So at the end of the first turn, if you decide to make meeples, you'll be feeding six instead of five at the end of the turn. The other place that you can put a meeple in this area is at the tool hut. 
and you can put one maple here and in return you will get one tool. A tool allows you to add one to the roll of one of your die. Uh, getting them is very important and helps with gathering resources. They are two-sided. Uh, on this side, there's a one on this side, this one, there's a two on the other side. Um, and over here you get, there are threes and fours. When I show you a close-up of the player board, I'll explain how you, uh, you know which one of these to take and which side to display. Up at the top of the board is where you're going to be spending time collecting resources. Um, here is where you can collect wood, here you can collect clay, here you can collect stone, and here you can collect gold. There are seven spots for meeples at each one of these locations. When it's your turn to place meeples, you can place however many you want. Say I wanted to put three here. I would do that and that would be my turn and then the next person would place meeples. Um, there can be no more than seven at any one of these locations where you'd be collecting uh, resources. The exception to that is food, which is called the hunt. Uh, you can place an unlimited number of meeples in the hunt. There's no limit. Everybody can go on the hunt to roll for food. Because that's what happens when you put meeples on the resource gathering locations, is you're going to be rolling to find out how many of that item you get. If I put three meeples on wood, then I would get to roll three dice. And I like these dice because they are uh, they're primitive looking. They're kind of uh, rough hewn wood looking dice. I like that. Fits the theme. I would roll three dice and then I would divide the total number by three and I would get that many pieces of wood because, because wood costs three. So if I roll Let's say I did that and I rolled 12. That's a nice roll for wood. I would divide by three and my little maples would carry on their backs four pieces of wood back to my board, which I would then be able to save to buy different things with later. If you're rolling for clay, you would divide this same, it would be the same thing and you would be dividing this number by four. So 12 divided by 4 would be 3, so you would get 3 of these. If you're rolling for stone, and you rolled a 12, stone is divided by 5. So you would get 2 stone out of 12. If you're rolling for gold, gold is the most expensive. It is 6, so you would divide 12 by 6 and get 2 gold. Let me show you how tools work real quickly. Let's say you had rolled and 11. Oh, sad. 11 divided by 6 is only 1. All I need is one more in order to get 2 gold. Well, if you had a tool on your board, you could tap it, much like a, you'd tap a magic card. Uh, you'd tap it, and that would give you plus 1 to this roll, which would give you 12, and allow you to victoriously carry home 2 gold instead of the mere 1 that you would have had otherwise. That's how tools work. When rolling for food, you divide by 2 and you get that many. So our roll of 12 divided by 2 would give us 6 food, uh, which is uh, a pretty good number for when you're feeding this many people. Down at the bottom of the board are going to be 4 civilization cards. In order to get these cards, now, and I'm going to point out, the very first time I played this game, I totally underestimated the value of these cards at the end of the game. Um, what happens is, if you want one of these cards, you place your meeple on it. And then, when uh, it comes time to collect your meeples, you must pay one resource of any type in order to get this card. This requires two resources of any type. This card is three resources, and this card would be four resources. So these two are pretty expensive cards, unless they're very special. Maybe at the end of the game, there's one in particular you really need, and it's worth paying three or four resources for. Um, but what's going to happen is, I would pay, let's say I had wood on my board. Here's my wood. 
So let's say I pay one wood for this card. Um, I immediately get the benefit that's at the top half of the card. On this particular card, the top half is roll. And what you do is you roll a die for each person that's in the game. And then, starting with you, because you're the one who bought the card, let's say I roll four dice, and they go everywhere. Let's say I rolled those four dice. Starting with me, I would get to choose which one of the rewards I wanted from the die roll. And let's say uh, I want the six. The six is a farm. So I'm going to take the six and I'm going to get a farm. And then it would go clockwise from my position. Um, and then the next person would say, oh, well, I'm going to take the gold for with a four. And then the next person would say, well, well I'm going to take clay. And then the last person goes, well, I'll take wood. Okay. And that's how you resolve the roll when it appears on a die like this, uh, or a, on a card. Um, same thing with this card, the same roll. The bottom half of the card is counted at the end of the game. This particular one gives you one point times the number of huts that you own. And huts are the ones that are located next to the cards. I'm going to show you those next. Uh, this one would give you two points um, per hut that you have. This, and it would immediately give you two food. This is another card where you get to roll at the top. At the end of the game, you would score one point per farm you have. And this one would give you immediately a stone. And at the end of the game, would score you one point per farm. Every card is different. Every card gives you something immediately that's at the top half. And something immediately, or something that scores at the end of the game at the bottom half. And they are cumulative. If you got these two cards you would score two points per every farm you had. Same thing with these guys, these are cumulative. If you had both of these cards, you would score one, two, three points per hut that you have. And that's part of a strategy that you can employ when you're playing the game, is if you know you're getting a lot of huts or a lot of farms, you can try to pick up the civilization cards that have those numbers on them. And what would happen now, I, after I bought this card, is it would go face down next to my board. And then if no one else bought cards, these would all slide down. And a new card would get put here. So as the game goes on, the cards get cheaper. Uh, well, the cards that were at the top will get cheaper because they will slide down as people buy the less expensive cards. This is a card that sometimes people can find confusing. Um, because they're cards, they're two cards that, or they're cards that look very similar. Um, this card, which has a tool with a two on it, it means that you can use that tool that turn immediately, and then you do not get it again. If there was a plus sign next to this, you would permanently get to take a tool or, or, or plus two tools um, to add to your board. This is not that card. This does not have a plus sign. So it would make a difference when you're picking the, in the order that you choose to pick up your workers in. Because this is a card you would have to use that turn. So you would want to pay for this card, pick it up so that you could use it on a roll that turn. Uh, unless you're specifically going for the bottom effect, which is two points per tool that you have on your board uh, at the end of the game. There are a lot of different civilization cards. I just wanted to show you two um, that, that are, are, are examples of uh, ones that are gonna come up frequently. Uh, these cards have artifacts at the bottom of them. Um, if you collect cards with artifacts at the bottom, they're going to count as for scoring at the end of the game. For each unique artifact you have, it's uh, squared. Basically, you multiply the uh, number of cards you have by its, by itself so you square it and then you add any duplicates. So in this case if I had these two cards I would score four points because one, two, two times two is four. If you had five different cards you would score 25 points and then you would add in any duplicates as individual numbers. If for instance you had two of these loom cards and you had this one you would score five points because two times two is four plus one additional loom card would be five points. That's how you score the artifact cards.
These are huts. I just mentioned them earlier in reference to the civilization cards. If you want to buy a hut, you place your maple on the little circle and you can buy the one that's on top and then you have to pay the cost that's noted at the bottom. Um, once you pay the cost that's noted at the bottom, then you get that many points. For instance, this hut, you would pay one clay, one stone, one gold, and you would get 15 points, which is the same as adding together uh, four, five, and six. Uh, this one is a little unique. You have to pay four total resources, and they have to be of two different types. So you could pay one wood and three brick, or you could pay two gold and two stone, and whatever you pay gets added together, and that's the number that you score. So you score the total value of what you paid. For this one, it's one to seven resources of any type. Um, it can be any different combination of one to seven resources. This is a pretty handy one. It's nice if you got a lot of gold because this, the result is the same. You add together how much you paid in order to score that hut. Once a hut is purchased, it's flipped upside down, placed on your board, and then the next one underneath of it is flipped over and is available for purchase the next round. Right here next to the huts is the farm track. This is where you note how many farms you have. If you have three farms, that means that's three less food you have to spend each turn to feed your peoples. Um, you can have as you can have up to ten meeples because that's how many color, how many of each color come with the game. So if you manage to get ten farms, you wouldn't even have to worry about food. You would be automatically feeding your meeples every turn. Here's a close-up of a player board. He's got his meeples up at the top. He's got his stack of civilization cards off to the side that he'll be able to count at the end of the game. He's got some huts that he's collected that he's placing at the bottom. And there's, a, there's spaces for five huts, but there's no limit on how many you can get. You can just start stacking them, or you can have a little trail of huts off to the side. It doesn't matter. Um, this is just to show you that you can store huts here. Off to the side is where he has his tools. And right now he has all of his boxes of tools filled. The next time he gets a tool, he would flip over this first one to a two. And as he got another tool, he would then flip over this one to a two. When you go to use tools, you have to use the whole tool. So you, if for some reason, if you, if you rolled a dice and say he only needed a one on it, he would probably just use this one because he could tap that and just get the one point out of it instead of wasting a tool for two. They do all get reset at the end of each turn. But knowing which one to use in each situation um, is an important part of the strategy of the game. Once all of these have been flipped over to twos, and then he gets another tool, this gets turned in, I make a mess on the board, and then he gets a three. Then once all these get filled into two, to threes, he would then get a four. But that's a lot of tools. That usually doesn't happen. But that's how the tools work on your player board. There's also a summary of how much all of the resources are worth and a place to store those resources. There's also a summary of how the end game scoring of the civilization cards works. Make sure you remember to feed your maples at the end of every turn. If for some reason you don't have enough food to feed your meeples, let's say, let's say I had to feed five meeples, but I only have two food. Fortunately for us, our meeples will eat resources. You can feed your meeples wood. You can feed them clay. You can feed them stone. You can even feed them gold. They're surprisingly resilient, and uh, apparently they are like goats in what they will eat. Um, I don't know if they're particularly happy about it, but you can feed them wood. If you uh, are unable to do that, or if you don't want to do that, uh, you would take minus 10 points for each meeple that you cannot feed. That's a lot. Uh, if you would go negative by doing that, like if you haven't moved far enough along the, uh, the track, the victory point track, 
that minus 10 would take you back below here and make it look like you have a ridiculously large number. Make sure you keep track of that so you know that you're in the minus um, and not in the plus. There are 100 and 200 point chips uh, that can be handed out in case you start doing laps around, uh, around the victory point track. There's nothing to denote minuses, but that usually doesn't happen. The game ends in one of two ways. Either you don't have enough civilization cards left to fill the slots that become empty, or one of the hut stacks gets down to the last uh, and the final hut gets bought. Um, in that case, the game would end and final scoring would occur. Final scoring happens uh, using your civilization cards. You also get one point per each resource you have on your board. Does not account, it does not include food. Um, you do not automatically get to count farms, people, tools, or any of that unless you have a civilization card that says that you get to count a particular benefit. And whoever has the most points at the end of the game wins. Also, uh, if you smell the cup, you automatically lose. I did say that I would mention the differences in how you uh, play the game if you have either three or two players. And I will mention that now. The first difference is in setup. If you're playing with three players, uh, you normally put out four stacks of these and there are seven, uh, for the base game, there are seven in each stack and you put out four of these. If you're playing with uh, three players, you only put out three stacks, the extras go in the box. If you're only playing with two players, you would play with two stacks and the extras go in the box. So it has an effect on how long the game is. So that's uh, the difference in setup. During actual gameplay, with two or three players, only two of these places may be taken at any one time. Of the uh, farm, the tool hut, and the maple love shack, instead of being able to use all three, you can only use two if you're playing with two or three players. If you're playing with three players, only two people may place meeples on the wood, clay, stone, or uh, gold resource collection areas, even if there's still open spaces. So let's say I put three guys on wood. Maybe blue doesn't need wood, but he just wants to block anybody else from being able to get wood. He could put a guy there, and no one else can put guys there if you're playing with three people. If you're playing with two people, only one person can put meeples on any of the resource collection areas. The only one that's an exception to that rule is the hunt. There's never a limit to how many meeples or, or how many um, different types of meeples can go on the hunt. And that's the differences for playing with two or three players. But otherwise, that's it. That is Stone Age. It's a really fun game. I've played it with a wide variety of people from ages literally eight, 8 to 80. I have played this game. Um, it is very well received. It's a lot of fun. Um, I highly recommend it. I believe this was the first game that I played when I went to my first meeting at my local uh, board gaming uh, society. I think this was the first game I played, and then I went out and bought it because I wanted it. There is an expansion out for it that's uh, it's kind of fun. I, I, I kind of like the base game better, but the expansion makes, you know, throws up some little interesting changes in there and allows you to add another person to play, so you could go up to five people. Um, but I believe that's it for today. Thanks for visiting the Dragon Table. I will see you next time.